again. I call the meeting of the Environment, Climate, and Legacy Committee to order. We now have quorum and let the record reflect that as uh, February 28th at uh, 3.04. And the first bill here is uh, Senator Kupak, Senate File 1033, and Senator Kupak's already ready to go <laughs> right there on the presentation desk. So, uh, Senator Kupak, anytime you're ready, uh, you may call your testifier up as well. Sure. Thank you, uh, Chair Herb. Uh, so a fairly uh, simple bill uh, in terms at least of uh, language here uh, in, in front of you. Uh, the Senate file 1033. Uh, this is an appropriation uh, for money for the uh, uh, Red River Mediation Agreement. Uh, that's a flood media, uh, mediation agreement that goes back to 1998 out of the results of the devastating 1997 flood uh, in the Red River Valley. I have a uh, testifier here who can speak a little bit more to uh, what that uh, the mediation means. Good and afternoon, Chair yes. Herb, members of the committee. My name is Lisa Frenette. I'm with the Red River Watershed Management Board. Thank you very much to Senator Kupak for authoring this bill for us. Um, we are asking right now for an increase from $264,000 a year, which is a base in the DNR's base budget, to $300,000 uh, for um, operational costs uh, as time has gone on. It's been over 10 years, I believe, since we've had an increase. Um, this funding is will also uh, be matched by watershed districts and the Red River Watershed Management Board, as well as the uh, Red River... Uh, the watershed districts of the Red River Watershed Management Board, as well as in-kind donations from the Red River Watershed Management Board of up to $100,000. Um, the landmark agreement that Senator Kupak referenced was a milestone for the Red River Valley, its local governments, and the state and federal agencies to partner on planning and design and funding for projects for flood to hazard mitigation enhanced coordination between the partners developing the projects and the implementation of natural resource enhancements that included wetlands, water quality storage, uh, outdoor, heritage, out, or, outdoor habitat, and uh, recreational activities. Uh, the project's uh, outcomes have included over 60 flood hazard mitig mitigation projects co-funded by the Red River Watershed Management Board and its participating watershed districts, 11 projects currently in the queue, and 10 water quality projects. The outcomes prevent loss of life, damage to public infrastructure like roads and bridges, it reduces damage to agricultural land as well as providing an outlet for upstream ag lands and it protects the communities and business investments. Most importantly, something I've tried to get everybody to understand while I've been working with the Red River is that being proactive and funding these projects reduces the cost of flood recovery in the long run. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Frenet. Um, questions from members? <laughs> Senator Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and to the author or the testifier. Uh, I, you know, we, we spoke earlier uh, to the testifier and, and that uh, in, the, in the bills, it sounds like the Red Board's asking for like $73 million in different projects this year. Uh, and so uh, this one, I just want to make it clear because you talked a lot about the, the projects that you do. Now, this money is only for administration. Is that, is that correct? It's for uh, uh, Ms. Ms. Fernet. Mr. Chair, Senator Green, and members of the committee, it is not just for administration, but it's to help technical committees implement uh, project process, go through uh, peer review process, et cetera. Follow so, up, thank Senator. you, Mr. Chair. But the point is, none of this is for projects. It's 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 no, there's no boots on the ground. This this goes into administrative cost. Uh, um, other uh, wages, I guess, for, for lack of a better word. And so basically, you're looking for at between this and the other match, about $600,000 a year for to oversee. Is, is that correct? Ms. Mr. Burnett. Chair, Senator Green, and members of the committee, uh, to a degree is correct. We put in a half a match that is the watershed districts of the Red River 
Valley put in a match that matches the 264 now. If we get the increase to the 300, they will put in that match also. This is specifically yes for the planning of projects, et cetera, throughout the Red River Valley. It includes watershed districts that are members of the Red River Watershed Management Board and the watershed districts that are not part of the Red River Watershed Management Board but sit within the Red River Valley. Senator Green. Mr. Chair. Um, and I'm familiar with some of the watershed uh, goings on and watersheds spend a lot of money on planning of these projects that they also pay for. So what's the difference between what the watersheds are spending uh, in individual watersheds and this on planning? Ms. Frenette. Mr. Chair, Sarah and Green, members of the committee, I would have to go back and find out what the difference is and I can get you some answers on that. Um, but. The bill you're referring to for the projects is a bonding bill. It is the half, the state's half match of the Red River Watershed Management Board and its participating watershed districts. Uh, just a comment, uh, and I'd appreciate that information. Uh, and then also just another comment on, uh, on the half match. Uh, when that bill comes forward, we won't talk about it now because it's not here, but when that bill comes forward, I'd be interested in knowing on the match, how much of the match is also state funds? Thank you. Thank you, Senator Green. <clears throat> okay, um, Senator Kupak, any closing remark? Or, oh, oh, sorry, uh, Senator, Senator House Chow, uh, go ahead. Thank you, Chair Her and Senator Kupak, for bringing this bill forward. Um, you and I have a little bit of a kinship, me growing up in Fargo, and I remember in '97, I grew up probably a quarter mile from the Red River. And I remember as a kid, I think I was in fourth grade, walking along the sandbags on my house with water up to the sandbags and us thinking that our house was gonna be destroyed. Um, and I think a lot of people remember that history along the Red River. Um, and I appreciate the due diligence and the work that you all do uh, in mitigating that risk in the future. Um, that floodplain is, is vast. <laughs> and so it's really, really important that we provide the resources that we need to protect these communities, uh, both in North Dakota and, of course, uh, on our side in, in Minnesota. So anyway, I just bring that up. I've had firsthand experience with this, and I'm very supportive of, of this. So thanks so much. Thank you. Um, uh, Senator Green, for further uh, just, discussion. Just uh, another comment to that. Thank you for that. Uh, but I will say that since 1997, when that flood occurred, we have poured millions upon millions of dollars into this, and there's a lot of projects on the ground right now, and a lot of them that have already been done. And at some point, I would like to see them tell me, when are you going to finish? Because it just seems like it's this cash cow. They come back for year after year after year, and, uh, and I would like to know what's been accomplished so far with the money at some point. Thank you. Senator Wiesenberg. Uh, thank you, Chair. So the Red River Flood Damage Reduction Work Group, I guess I have a question. Who is, is this a, a group of people? Are they volunteers? Are they currently paid? Who's in charge of this? Thank you. Uh, Ms. Frenette. Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Wiesenberg. My apologies, my glasses aren't working in that direction very well. Um, thank you very much for the question, members of the committee. Um, the uh, um, flood damage reduction group was born out of a 1998 mediation agreement uh, when there was um, a lot of contest over who would pay for flood damages up in the area and how it would be paid for. And, uh, it was told, they were told by a judge they had to come forward with a mediation agreement. The folks that are involved in it right now are the Red River Watershed Management Board, watershed districts, again, not just the watershed districts that are members, but the watershed districts within the Red River Valley, the Army Corps of Engineers, the DNR, Bowser, MPCA, counties, soil and water conservation districts are all members. Uh, we also have engineers that participate so that they can um, make sure that the projects are done properly. Uh, as the planning and design goes through. Senator Wiesenberg. Thank you, Chair. So I guess that was my question. It sounds like this money is for people, and it sounds like there's already a lot of people that know what they're doing. So if there's already a lot of people that know what they're doing, why are we acquiring, why are we asking for more money for, it sounds like there's a lot of people that already understand their jobs, and if they don't understand their jobs, they should, because they're watershed people. Um, 
So that's, I guess there's a lot of people I don't see why if this is just not going for sandbags or developing, develop, blah, blah, developing some kind of control system if it's just people, um, I'm, I'm assuming these people are already paid some other way, right? So I, I don't know where this money's Mr. going. Mr. or uh, Senator Kupak. Well, I, well I, I'll, well, I'll okay. start and then maybe you can finish. So, so Mr. Chair, Senator Wiesenberg. Um, so, I mean, a lot of this, what we need is we, we have trouble uh, keeping people with expertise and engineers uh, employed in some of these uh, watershed districts too because they, they, have, they run on grants and we don't know from day to year to year that they're going to be employed and we lose talented people. So in terms of we need to have the people that are designing this for the boots on the ground. And I will say uh, and in the Fargo-Moorhead area and specifically in Moorhead, uh, we have done a lot of flood mitigation and we are, and as a city, we're just about done with our flood mitigation. But the northern end of the Red River Valley uh, is still uh, the impacts of spring flooding uh, from areas particularly north of Moorhead, north of Grand Forks. And so these are areas actually that are outside of my district or in Senator Johnson's district. Uh, the city of Oslo becomes an island nearly every spring. And there are lots of things that we can do uh, in terms of impounding this water in different ways in, in particularly in ways that are work in conjunction with our farmers and also create a uh, habitat for the birds that are moving through in the spring in terms of impounding some of this water. These are all projects that uh, need to continue and continue to go on because the, particularly uh, while the southern end or the upper end of the river, which because the river flows to the north, which is part of the problem with the Red River, uh, is, is uh, still a, quite a large problem on the northern end of the valley. And Mr. Chair and Senator Wiesenberg and members of the committee, just to add on to that, uh, the Red River still has some issues. As you notice, there's funding for Moorhead that still has some some um, some issues with flood hazard mitigation. But a lot of the secondary and tertiary rivers, the Roseau River, Thief River, um, the uh, the the biggest project that we have going right now runs uh, up the Mastinka River. Uh, it is the Red Path, and they all flow into the Red River because the way the river flows north, everything, as Senator Kupak has said, freezes up north, and so we're still trying to take care of those areas. And as much as it seems like we have poured a lot of money into the Red River watershed or the Red River Valley over the years, a lot of it has been for the cities. The watershed districts have actually only received less than 14% of the funds, and this, the watershed districts, this funding for the watershed districts and to get these projects um, designed and implemented will help then the, the outer areas, the more the, some of the rural areas, the farmland, the smaller communities, and like um, the city of Oslo that Senator Kupak referenced. Okay, well thank, thank you both. Um, with no further question or discussion, um, is there any member in the audience that wanna speak and support or testify? Just thought we go back, we just go through the, the check mark here. None. So, uh, Senator Kupak, any closing comments? Sure. And, and I would just like to, to say um, Minnesota has really done a lot of this flood mitigation the right way uh, because we have used state money to do this, whereas our friends to the west, North Dakota, it sometimes has relied more on federal money to do this. Uh, by using state money, that has freed up our options of what we can do on the Minnesota side. So while they are constrained sometimes with what they can do after they put up uh, flood mitigation projects, we have a little bit more flexibility, which leads to uh, further economic development, economic redevelopment along those things after those flood mitigation projects are, are put in because we've used Minnesota dollars to do that. So this is worthwhile projects in the end. Okay. Well, thank you, Senator Kupak and uh, Ms. Frenette for um, presenting this bill. And uh, we will lay this bill over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. So thank you both. Okay. Thanks, thank you, Senator okay. Herb. Next on the agenda here, agenda here is Senate File 440, Senator Morrison, Metropolitan Landfill Contingency Action Trust Account Money Transfer Authorization.
Anytime you're ready, Sarah Morrison, and uh, introduce your name for the record as both of you uh, begin speaking. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Senator Kelly Morrison, District 45. Thank you for the opportunity to present Senate File 440. This bill requires the Commissioner of Management and Budget to transfer $29,055,000 from the General Fund to the Metropolitan Landfill Contingency Action Trust, affectionately known as MLCAT, account before June 30th, 2024 to restore funds that were taken from the account. This amount would make the account whole by restoring money previously transferred from the account with interest. The account was established in the 80s to address both short-term and long-term environmental problems at landfills. The money was taken to solve the general fund deficits and the funds were never replaced. Uh, it was obviously the clear intent of the legislature to restore these funds and we're now at a critical point. There are significant concerns that the shortfall will impact remediation, creating a direct threat to the public health of people living in the surrounding communities. Our health is impacted by where we live, work, play, and worship, and no one should face worse health, worse health outcomes by virtue of their zip code. And that's exactly what will happen if we don't act. We have the opportunity here to be proactive, responsive, and work to prevent and mitigate environmental threats, and that begins with restoring funds to the account with interest. And I will stop there, Mr. Chair, and turn it over to um, my first testifier, Commissioner Halverson. Commissioner, welcome, and please in, say your name for the record. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. I'm Lori Halverson. I am Dakota County Commissioner. Um, I am also here on behalf of MICA, the Minnesota Intercounty Association. I serve as treasurer on their executive committee. Um, as you just heard, um, the uh, Minis Metropolitan Landfill Contingency Action Trust um, has been a land landfill cleanup fund that has been supported from fees paid by landfills. Um, it receives a quarter of its proceeds from the Metropolitan Solid Waste Landfill fee. Um, as uh, Senator Morrison mentioned, in 2003 and 2005, $14 million was borrowed against this fund with the intention that the legislature would pay the money back um, when mm -hmm. times were better. Um, and I think that these are those times. Um, it's a fee on mixed uh, municipal solid waste, and um, I did actually serve in the legislature, and my joke is you know you're serving in uh, county government when you start having conversations about solid waste. So I um, felt very, um, very committed as a county commissioner when I had my first solid waste um, conversation. And uh, we host two active landfills in Dakota County um, that are impacted by um, and that pay into um, this uh, fund, including the Pine Bend Landfill in Rosemont and the Burnsville Landfill. Um, these two active landfills are the only ones that are currently playing into MELCAT, which is uh, available um, to eligible landfills in the metro. Um, and it's important to note that 75% of the waste that is taken into these landfills does not come from Dakota County. It comes outside of Dakota County. So it really is a metro-wide um, benefit and it will be a serious Dakota County impact once these landfills um, close. Um, in 2021, we do want to say that we're really grateful that the legislature approved paying back $100,000 annually um, to pay back on some past transfers. However, it would take about 300 years to restore the $14 million that um, we, uh, that was borrowed from that. So um, we are asking for your support to repay MELCAT so that we can build the funds necessary to protect the residents that live, um, work, uh, play, go to school um, within just feet of these landfills. Um, there are seven total eligible landfills in Melcat, including three in Dakota County. Um, that includes another a, a number of closed landfills which have been drawing on this. So other communities have actually been benefiting from this. However, since we still have active landfills and these funds are meant to offset impacts up to 30 years beyond when they close, um, the need to refill the funds for those of us who are still operating active landfills and haven't closed our landfills um, is gonna be extremely important. <laughs> 
the Washington County landfill closed in 1975 and went, went through a $23 million cleanup in 2009. So I think that gives you some idea of the time, timing and uh, economic impact that it has on, on local governments. And this landfill was about one-tenth of the size of the active landfills in Dakota County. Um, without the effort to replenish MELCAT, um, the existing and estimated future balance of the fund will not be sufficient to address the post-closure impacts of uh, the seven eligible landfills, including the two that I've mentioned to Dakota County. So I am here um, to strongly urge you um, to uh, fund MELCAT and ensure the proper um, protection of public health and the environment in the future. And I also just want to mention, as I uh, said, I was here on behalf of Dakota County and MICA, um, and uh, I do have uh, s expert staff here if anybody has technical questions, um, as well as uh, MICA staff here. Um, and I also want to mention that the Association of Minnesota Counties, which represents all 87 counties in the state of Minnesota, also supports this legislation. With that, I thank you for your time and stand ready for questions. Thank you, Commissioner Halverson. Um, I have a list here, Mr. Matt Mass Massman. Are, are you? you um, are you? Are you, you, you okay? All right. Okay. Sounds good then. Also, uh, uh, just for the record, we have letter of support from the Partnership on Waste and Energy. Uh, it's in your package, two members, uh, and also. Um, Minnesota Center for Environmental Advocacy. Um, Association of Minnesota Counties and Minnesota Inter-County Association. Um, members, any questions? Uh, Senator Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and for the author. Um, 14 million was transferred, but you're asking for substantially more than that back. Seems like quite, a, quite an increase, and I think if my memory serves right, it wasn't that many years ago they were just asking for the, the, the 14 million. So why the, so, well, it's probably well, it's over doubled by far. Uh, what is the reason for the increase? Sarah Morrison. Uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Green, staff is here to, to respond to that, but it's my understanding that that is to cover the interest and lost investment income. Okay, uh, staff can go ahead and introduce your name for the record and um, uh, you may proceed. Nicole Stewart with Dakota County, Mr. Chair. You're right. I wouldn't have anything more to add. The PCA was able to generate those numbers based on a previous last year question from um, the Senate, I believe. <laughs> Senator Green. Mr. Chair, yeah, thank you for that. Uh, it does seem a little high, but I guess I understand that there should be some interest, but double is, is quite a bit. The other question is... Um, only uh, just under 10 million of this was uh, transferred out of MILCAT to the general fund. The other 4 million came from uh, the uh, rural development account. And so would it be uh, advisable then to split that difference up and take the portion from the general fund uh, that went to the general fund and from the rural development account to that? Senator Morrison. Commissioner Allison. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Chair, and thank you, um, Senator Green, for that question. Um, it is uh, really our position that um, because of the way that these dollars were meant to be used, that um, putting the best investment is to put them back into MELCAT for what was transferred out. One more question then, uh, Mr. Senator Chair. Senator Green. Uh, thank you. Um, do, d does the, I, I guess, is, is there projects ready to go for this or is this just going to be transferred in and put into an account? I, I don't even know how much is in the Milcat account right now. I probably should have looked that up, but uh, is, is, there, uh, uh, is there projects ready to go for this as we speak? Ms. Storr. Mr. Chair, um, member, there are current plans by the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency that they're working on, and right now, for the next couple of years, they've got 2.5 million that are planned for some of the existing facilities, and right now there's an account of 19.5 million. 
Um, but again, it's really planning for the future and that long-term care of some of these other facilities just in general. Okay, so then just a comment, Mr. Chair. Then it does look Senator. like it's just going to be put into account and, uh, and left there uh, for whatever they decide to use it for. Because if you got $19 million in an account and you're only scheduled to spend another $2.5 million, that's quite a difference. But thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Green. Okay, any further discussion from members? Any uh, folks in the audience uh, like to testify? All right, good. Uh, Senator Morrison, closing comments. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, members, for considering this bill. This, this issue has been around for a long time, and I'm hopeful that this is the year that we can make this right. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Morrison. And we will lay this bill over. Uh, for possible inclusion in an in omnibus bill. Thank Next you, is Chair. also Senator Morrison bill, uh, Senate File 1001, 1001, Regional Parks and Trail Appropriation. So, Senator Morrison, any time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, members, thanks for the opportunity to present Senate File 1001, uh, the Regional Parks and Trails Appropriation. Senate File 1001 seeks to secure $40 million in fiscal years 2024 and 2025 from the General Fund to the Metropolitan Council for grants to operate and maintain the Metropolitan Area Regional Park System. This, uh, according to Minnesota Statute Section 473351, this statute authorizes no less than 40% of the actual cost of operating the regional park system to be appropriated from state funding. The annual cost to operate and maintain the regional park system is just over $120 million. The state currently funds about 9% of the cost, which leaves a funding gap that local park agencies have to manage through. This bill would bring the funding level much closer to the 40% state obligation and help maintain a vibrant regional park system for all Minnesotans to enjoy. And with that, Mr. Chair, I will turn it over to my testifiers. Yep. Uh, please state your name for the record. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members, Senator. My name is Mark McCabe, and I'm the director for the Ramsey County Parks and Recreation Department, but I'm here representing the 10 park agencies that own and operate the Metropolitan Regional Park System and speaking in support of this bill. So thank you for your time. Um, the Metropolitan Regional Parks and Trail System really functions as the state park system of the metro area with over 54,000 acres of land um, in 56 regional parks and park preserves. We you have a handout within your packet today that kind of goes through some of the key um, statistics there. Over 415 miles of uh, interconnected trails. And so people from all over the metro area and the state uh, utilize the system as there, there aren't uh, very many state parks in this uh, metro area. So again, this this uh, system serves that purpose for the metro region. One of our most uh, staggering statistics is just the number of visits that we receive to the regional park system. In 2021, there was over 65 million visits to the system. So that staggering figure really um, has considerable wear and tear on the system day in and day out. And that's why this operation and maintenance funding is so critical to maintaining the park system uh, that, that we love. This past year, uh, the 10 implementing park agencies that own and operate the system, as the Senator said, incurred, co incurred costs of over $120 million in operation and maintenance expenses. And again, as the, as the Senator mentioned, um, the Minnesota State Statute authorizes no less than 40% of the actual cost of this operating system to come from state funding and is currently funded at that 9% level. So the impact of this underfunding on maintenance and operations means that local taxpayers disproportionately pay for maintaining this much love system. And uh, we've learned through our research that if the system isn't adequately maintained, the quality of our visitor experiences decline as well as the resources that we're trying to maintain. And a, a really good robust uh, regional park system also supports the greater Minnesota system. So when one does well, the other does well as, as people experience the system and go out into greater Minnesota. So this uh, proposal 
again, significantly gets us closer to this 40% level. 100% of the funding uh, will be distributed to the 10 regional park implementing agencies through the Metropolitan Council's operation and maintenance program to support these critical operations and maintenance needs. So again, this bill really provides critical funding to help ensure that we're able to better care for this system into the future. Uh, with that, I'll turn over to my colleague, uh, Brian Rice. Uh, Mr. Rice, please state your name for the record. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Brian Rice. Um, I'm an attorney in Minneapolis, and I'm here today representing the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board. And I would really like to thank you, Mr. Chair, for scheduling this hearing, but I'd particularly like to thank Senator Morrison for introducing the bill. Um, and I, I would like to say this, to, uh, 140 years ago yesterday, the Minnesota legislature passed an act in 1883 that created the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board. Um, so my client's been alive for 140 years in one day. And in that legislation that created the park board, there were 10 individuals named to sit as the original board of commissioners. And one of them was uh, Mr. Dorillis Morrison, who happens to be the great, great grandfather of Senator Morrison. Um, Dorillis Morrison also donated the land that the Minneapolis Institute of Art sits on in a park. And so I want to thank you, Senator Morrison, for being, you and your family, for being such great uh, park advocates for many generations. I mean that sincerely. Okay. Thank you. Um, and this bill is important too, Senator. You're one of your predecessors on this committee when it was state government and included all of the agencies is where this uh, Metro Park Regional Fund legislation originated that created it and this committee, which was the prior committee had environment in it, made a commitment to Metro Parks because th they do serve as the DNR in the metro area. There's over 50 uh, parks that are in common between the seven counties, the uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul, uh, Bloomington, and Three Rivers Parks that serve the residents here. And the, uh, there are three DNR parks, and the DNR has got a great system, as we know, but their presence in the metro area is somewhat limited. Um, they have great trails. They have uh, Fort Snelling, William O'Brien, and Afton, and they're working on other parks, so they're uh, great. But if you want to get out and enjoy our natural resources in this state, and you're in the metropolitan area, you go to these big regional parks, which are only established if the Met Council approves them, and uh, they have to have certain characters. We, with the legislature's help, we've interconnected these parks. They built off systems that St. Paul uh, created and Minneapolis created even before 1883 and have expanded. And we really do have, uh, I would submit, in the whole state, some of the best parks in the country, probably the best park system in the country, if not the world, and maybe even the whole uh, universe. Uh, the Hubble telescope hasn't found a better one yet. Um, and. These dollars, it did, the, the legislation that created it, just quick background, was something that the Citizens League recommended uh, back in the late 70s, early 80s. The Senate did pick this up and created it. And what's of importance is the funding for this goes directly to those uh, cities and counties in the metropolitan area to operate and maintain the system. It's not for overhead. It's not um, uh, bonding money. It's to operate the day-to-day -day system to make sure that this asset that the state helped create through bonding and legacy, other things that are under your jurisdiction, Senator, are really operated and maintained. And I think as your committee's heard time after time, what's critical is not only operating it so it's delivering on its message, which is uh, 65 million user visits that come, but maintaining it so you don't take the system, wear it out, and then you have to put new capital in. And, um, the, um, there was a lot of thought that went into this legislation about how to allocate it. It's, uh, there's a formula that all the uh, uh, counties and cities have agreed to that the legislature has established. And it's called Metro Parks. The Metro Parks oversees the system, but the operation and maintenance is left at, at uh, the local level. So um, I know you've heard already today a lot of deferred maintenance issues, but uh, we've had a bill like this probably every year since 1985 when it was introduced. And uh, we, we really, these systems are great. Um, 120 million a year with 65 million user visits means it's about $2 every time somebody gets on one of these uh, over 400 miles of trails or goes over these 54 parks or sees nature and, 
It's really the best uh, thing. I said it's the best health club uh, you could buy in the country, and it's great for our citizens. I think it has a lot to do with uh, keeping our citizens healthy and, and uh, enjoying life. So thank you for your, this opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Rice, and thank, thank you for uh, sharing the historical context here, mm -hmm. the relevance to us. <laughs> and so, uh, see, uh, any questions from members? Sarah Wisenberg. Thank you, Chair. Um, so the Metropolitan City Regional Parks, are these all free to use? Senator Sarah Morrison or Mr. Sure. McKay? Yep, um, Mr. Chair and uh, Senator Wiesenberg, um, for I can speak to, to Ramsey County, they're free and open for use. I know with some of the regional parks, there are uh, gates, for example, where there's a, a gate fee that is paid to access into the park system. Um, I'd have to go through and, and do kind of an inventory on how many that is out of the 56 parks that, uh, that exist today. But um, some are free and open for access. Some have like a, a vehicle pass. Thank you. I guess that was the one question because um, I know we have parks in our areas, but some are free and some are paid for. So I guess if it's, that's equal, that would make sense. But um, you know, I think someone mentioned that these are like the state parks of the cities. I know, again, state parks, we all have to pay to get into a state park. So there's a fee associated, there's a user fee associated with the park. So um, I'm just qu questioning that, I guess. Mm -hmm. Mr. Rice. Uh, Mr. Chair, yes, that, it's a very good question, uh, Senator. Um, the uh, $120 million that's um, spent to operate these systems, we're getting about $10 million roughly from the state. Largely the rest of it is coming from property taxes in the metropolitan area, from city and county uh, uh, taxes. And I know it's um, a, a big criteria of this, it's not every park, and it's not like your basketball courts. In fact, you can't have kind of programmed recreation things. They're open space parks, which means they're usually a minimum of 250 acres. Uh, the parks also have to be some natural uh, feature. So the ones to, to think about would be uh, Como Park in uh, St. Paul is a major regional attraction. It does have the zoo, but that's considered separate from the regional park. Lebanon Hills uh, in Minneapolis, it's Chain of Lakes. Anoka County is Bunker Hills. Uh, suburban Hennepin Three Rivers has French Regional Park, um, one on Lake Minnetonka, a number of them that are large um, areas, and they're supported by um, largely by property taxes. Um, some might have fees for particular events uh, that happen, but mostly because of the density, it's, it's property taxes that pay for the um, uh, cost of the park. And um, the, the trails have become a, a major part. And trails, of course, are free. Um, so it's, um, it's, a, it's a great system. But I guess the answer to that is that people would pay their fees through their property taxes. Senator Wiesemer. Uh, thank you. Um, I'll let Senator Green go. So, Senator Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so, just a couple questions. First, the ten million dollars, and that that is included with the money that comes from Legacy Parks and Trails. Uh, also, bonding money that's gone to the Metro Park region, or don't you get that? Mr. McKay. Yep, Madam, or excuse me, Mr. Chair and uh, Senator Green, the. Uh, about 10 million that get that we received from maintenance and operation. I believe there's two and a half million um, that is coming from the state general fund, and then around seven and a half that is coming out of the lottery lieu proceeds. Okay, Senator Green. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, this is all new funding. This is 80 million dollars in new funding, and that's that's a big chunk to ask for the first time coming in, um, and. Uh, as far as the, the property tax paying for the parks, we do that in rural Minnesota too. We have county parks and city parks, and that's, that's the process. If you want to park, you pay for your park. So this is, this is quite a bit of money. And, and Mr. Chair, I'd like to offer the A1 amendment. Okay. Um, Senator Green, offer A1 amendment. And Mr. Chair, if it's okay, I can... 
I can explain the amendment while it's being passed around. Go ahead, Senator Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The A1 amendment actually splits just a 50-50 split. I know that Senator Housechild has a bill coming right after this where he's going to be asking for uh, 500000 per year for, uh, for parks out in uh, greater Minnesota. And if we're going to spend this kind of money, I would like to see it be an even split. Uh, we uh, have a lot more area to cover, and uh, a lot of our parks out there could also use a little more money. And so the A1 amendment uh, takes the the 40,000 per year, or 40 million per year and gets 20 million into the metro region and 20 million into the greater Minnesota. And I would ask for a roll call. Okay, uh, roll call is taken and um, Sarah Morrison. Um, Th thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and uh, I'm, I'd like a comment from my testifiers to this amendment. Mr. McCabe, Mr. McCabe, or Director McCabe. Mr. Chair and committee members, um, as far as the kind of reference to a first-time ask, I think we're, we're referencing the Minnesota state statute that's been referenced earlier, the 473-351, that authorized no less than the 40% of actual cost to be appropriated from state funding. So we feel that you know, that's what we're kind of building this um, off of the, the request. Um, so that is in state statute at that 40% level. And when we did the math on that with 120 million of expenses that the regional park system incurs, you know, what 40% of that is, this 40 million ask um, doesn't quite get us to that 40% uh, level, but gets us a lot closer to what um, we feel is the state, you know, what is the state obligation within that uh, state statute. So that's, that's what we're aiming for is just to have the funding level actually be reflective of what is in that statute. Mr. Rice. Mr. Rice. Uh, Mr. Chairman, yes. Um, just to go, to go back, the this, this statute that this request is based on is 473-351, subdivision 3, um, paragraph. It says each implementing agency must receive no less than 40% of its actual operations and maintenance expenses to be incurred in the calendar year if available funds are less than the total amount, uh, the money will be shared proportionally. What I would call the committee's attention to is that this deals with operations and maintenance costs of an existing system. These numbers are audited, reflected by the Met Council, and it's proportional to the dollars that are uh, spent. The amendment talks about making grants uh, for parks and trails of regional significance. The grants that I understand are done to not only our agency, but the greater Minnesota are in the form of capital grants to build projects or to repair projects. Not, we're talking about operations and maintenance here. And I do not know what the operation and maintenance costs of the regional parks in greater Minnesota are. I've never seen a report on that. I'm sure they have them. Um, I think that's certainly something the legislature would consider. Whether it amounts to 20 million or not, I don't know. But given that the regional park system in um, the metropolitan area has 120 million of documented expenses that have been reported to the legislature, which this law requires, that's, we, we these parks, the legislature created, or at least set in statute, these are, uh, in, in essence, state assets, and we're required to report to this legislature what those cost of those parks are. So, I mean, it's obviously within the purview of the committee to do what it wants, but it's, it seems to me you're mixing grants for projects with operation maintenance cost of existing systems. So, Mr. Chair. Senator Green. Uh, Senator Green. If, if the author of the bill wants to go before me, she certainly can. She, <clears throat> Senator Morrison. Mr. Chair, Senator Green, if, if you have more to say, I, I was just going to make my recommendation on the vote. <laughs> okay. All right, Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, the, the issue of the, whether it's grants or just money awarded, uh, whether it's going for maintenance or, or anything else, uh, the fact of the matter is you have $120 million coming in to manage these parks. So whether you want to, you know, shift the numbers around to say this, this portion's going for this, that portion's going for that, if this bill passes, you've got an extra 40 million bucks to, of taxpayer dollars to play with. And, uh, and so that's really not an issue. 
but the issue is that this is money that's going to be coming from the general fund, so it's coming from all over the state. And if it's going to be spent on parks, it should be spent all over the state. And so, uh, Mr. Chair, did I, I did ask for a recorded roll call? Did I do that? Yeah, yes, you did. Uh, okay, thank Senator. you. Mr. Chair, I think he's asking for it to also be recorded in the journal. Yep. Okay. That will require three, three hands. Okay. The roll call will be recorded in the journal. Uh, Senator House Chow. Thank you, Chair Herr and uh, Senator Green. I appreciate the amendment, and certainly I'm excited to present my bill uh, next. Um, you know, what I would say is I would be happy to accept a friendly amendment to dramatically increase the funding for Greater Minnesota Parks and Trails. Um, but I would, you know, I, I'll be voting for, for this bill as the author is presenting it, as she's worked with the stakeholders involved and knows what the needs are in her region and, and that part of the state. But happy to dramatically increase the funding for Greater Minnesota Parks and Trails because it's, um, it's, a, it's a group that I uh, strongly support. Senator Green. Nice try, Senator Hulschild. <laughs> the fact is, we got a lot of money here on the table, and it's coming out of the general fund. I, uh, and I don't know if this bill is being passed on or laid over. I didn't hear that. But if it's being laid over, this money is going to have to be appropriated as, as the money's available. And so to add more to the spending, besides what's in this bill, would be irresponsible. Uh, what, this is, uh, what this amendment does is just an attempt to even out the money that's been asked for. Thank you. Senator Wisenberg. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm, I'm looking at Minnesota Statute 473.35. Do you know the history of this? It looks like it was just, is it just from 2022? Thank you. Mr. Rice. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Wiesenberg, um, this law was passed in 1985 as part of what was then the omnibus state government finance bill that included um, back then that was state government, really all state government, general fund, DNR, uh, environment, uh, courts, uh, state government, the legislature, everything. Did that help? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, I was just wondering, has it always been um, the 40 percent then is what I'm trying to find. I'm trying to read through the older bills to see where that number is. Thank M you. Mr. Chair. M Mr. Rice. Yes, it has always been 40 percent. That was the recommendation of the um, Citizens League. So any further discussion on this amendment? Mr. Chair. Uh, oh, Senator Morrison. Good. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Green, I, I appreciate um, your point with the amendment, and I absolutely support funding parks and trails in greater Minnesota, but I think that is a separate bill, so I would um, urge a no vote on the amendment. Thank you. Um, we will motion uh, Senator Green's amendment. Amendment A1, and this will be a roll call vote. Uh, may the clerk uh, record the votes. Chair Her? No. Senator McEwen? No. Senator Eichhorn? Aye. Senator Green? Aye. Senator House Child? Senator Hoffman? No. Senator Kunish? Senator Lane? Aye. Senator Morrison? No. Senator Wiesenberg? Aye. Senator Kunish? Okay. Um, there's uh, five. 
five I and four nay. Uh, the motion of the motion for amendment A one is adopted. Senator Hao Chao, you want to change your vote, or I, I don't. Maybe you're. I guess I'm confused. I, I um, yeah, I'll ch I'll change my vote. I I didn't realize which way we were voting, so okay. I'll vote. N no. Nay. <laughs> okay. Sorry. All right. Okay. So, uh, thank you for that expression, sir. House Chow. <laughs> So, uh, Sometimes you don't hear your own voice when you're... Okay. Are you doing any form of retraction? No. Okay. All right. Looks like I just had to uh, state the votes again. You know, so um, we have uh, four... Yay and five nay. The motion is not adopted. Okay. Back to the bill. Uh, Senator Morrison. Uh, Mr. Chair, members, thank you for the opportunity and for the consideration. I, I hope that uh, this will be included in the omnibus bill. Good. All right. So this bill is... Senate file 1001 is laid over for possible inclusion. And I appreciate everyone's cooperation for that little minor uh, confusion. So next is Senate House House, your bill. Senate file 527. Take your time and you may, pro you may proceed. I think we have uh, a few, two remote testifiers online. Um, but uh, Senator House Chow, you may uh, present your bill and then we'll call the testifier. Th thank you, Chair Her and members. Um, today I'm excited to present Senate File 527, which was already referenced in the previous bill. One of the things to me that makes Minnesota such a great place to live is our abundant parks and trails. As you just learned from the previous bill, regional parks plays an essential role for Minnesotans. Regional parks and trails provide close to home opportunities to recreate for residents, as well as an escape from those living a distance away when they travel. Minnesotans as well as visitors from other states and Canada also enjoy these, uh, these places. Greater, Greater Minnesota has long had regional parks and trails, but they were not organized until 2013 when the legislator created the Greater Minnesota Regional Parks and Trails Commission to create a regional system covering the 80 counties outside the metro area. This bill makes a simple request. We're asking for 500,000 per year to pay for operations of the commission. As you've probably heard from me in previous bills, the parks and trails of Greater Minnesota do not receive much funding from the state. Right now, they receive 20% of the legacy funds and must use a portion of that to pay for the commission's operations. This bill would allow more of the legacy, more of the legacy funds to be dedicated to parks and trail projects. Um, given the, the previous amendments on the previous bill and, and comments, I would also be open to suggested friendly amendments if Senator Green is interested. Um, and with that, I do have two testifiers today to, to discuss a bill and we'll take any questions. All right, let's go to the testifier first. Um, so the testifier, you have to turn on your camera uh, before we can, quote unquote, spot you. So, um, Mr. Metzen. Um, Thank you, Chair Her. I hope that you can see me. Yes. Camera is on. Good. Thank you. Please introduce your name for the record. 
Good afternoon, Chair Herr, Senator Hochschild, and committee members. I'm Renee Matson. I'm the Executive Director of the Greater Minnesota Regional Parks and Trails Commission. I'm sorry I'm unable to be there today in person, but thank you for the opportunity to address Senate File 527, which would provide the Greater Minnesota Regional Parks and Trails Commission with $1 million in the biennium for the operating budget of the commission. The commission, as previously noted, was formed in 2013 to undertake system planning for the 80 counties in Greater Minnesota. There are currently 74 designated parks and trails throughout Greater Minnesota, and we do anticipate adding another five to six facilities in 2023. The commission works with cities and counties to designate parks and trails in Greater Minnesota that have a regional significance, and that means that they draw visitors and users from a broad regional area, which translates into an economic impact for the area as well. And once these parks and trails are designated, they're eligible to apply for legacy funds for projects that tie to the master plan. To ensure that parks and trails added to the greater Minnesota system are truly regionally significant, there is a thorough vetting process. And that begins with an application that's reviewed against criteria by a five-member evaluation team. And then highly ranked applications are considered designation eligible and they're invited to submit a qualified master plan for our review. Then concurrent with the review of our, our review of the application and master plan, our system plan coordinator and myself visit each of the applicants and we ensure we're well informed about the Parker Trail and we also understand the goals of that master plan. The same careful vetting is done with each funding application, beginning with an application review against set criteria, another site visit by the staff and also commissioners, and then discussion over the course of several months, which ends with a recommendation to the legislature of projects to fund out of our portion of the legacy fund for Greater Minnesota. And of course, there are always more applications than dollars available. So any additional funds that we would ever receive for our operating budget would be well used for grants instead. We also conduct research regularly to learn more about who's using our system. And we have also undertaken a really significant project that's going to update mountain bike design guidelines for trail construction. And this would be the first update of any magnitude since 2017. The needs are real in greater Minnesota and without legacy funds, the projects that we uh, look at vet every year and recommend would take years to complete. Greater Minnesota is really at a distinct advantage having to use dollars that would be better spent funding projects rather than our operating budget. Our two partners in the fund receive general fund dollars and we're just asking for the same for greater Minnesota. And I'd like to thank you all for your time today and please ask you to include the million dollars this biennium for the commission uh, as you put together your budget. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Messon. And the next te testifier is uh, Mr. Kennedy. Uh, please turn on your camera so you can be spotted. Am I good? Okay, here I am. Are you able to see me? Yes, clearly. Okay, th thank you, Chair uh, Herr, for this opportunity to testify in support of this bill. My name is Tim Kennedy. I live in Grand Marais. This is part of uh, Senator House Child's district. I'm a former member of the Greater Minnesota Regional Parks and Trails Commission, having served as a District 1 Commissioner for five years. I'm also on the board of the Superior Cycling Association and served as its former president for 10 years. I can tell you that the growth and significance of the regional parks and trail system in greater Minnesota has been a huge success. As a commissioner, however, I saw the need for more funding for our regional parks and trails to help them serve our residents. These parks and trails make a big difference in their communities. They offer opportunities to connect people to the outdoors, which is one of the four pillars of the Parks and Trails Legacy Plan. Throughout Minnesota, we've experienced a resurgence in users uh, in recent years, which makes funding more important than ever. Every dollar does make a difference. 
As president of the Superior Cycling Association, I helped guide the adoption of a master plan for the Cook County mountain bike trail system, which includes 35 miles of single track mountain bike trails in Cook County. It is now one of the 70 plus parks and trails in greater Minnesota as part of that system. Um, Cook County, partnering with the Superior Cycling Association, received legacy funding in part to complete the jackpot high climber trail that connects the Sawbill Trail with Lutzen Mountains. This is a 16 mile wilderness mountain bike ride that's being proclaimed by riders as one of the best tra trails in the state and attracts riders from throughout the Midwest. This trail is significant in Cook County but would not, would not have happened without legacy funding and the ability to use those funds to leverage the additional funding needed to complete this trail. Cook County received $278,000 from legacy funding that led to a completion of the project that cost over $1 million. This is a, an example of how a small amount of funding can lead to great things. I can tell you that if you ride this trail, you know that this is an exceptional recreation resource, one that might not have happened without funding from the Greater Minnesota Regional Parks and Trails Commission. $278,000 of legacy funding was significant to the success of, Cook, of this Cook County project. It may not seem like a lot, but directing an additional $1 million into parks and trail projects could, could be the difference to other projects like the Cook County project, or to provide the resources to help prepare master plans, rehabilitate aging and well-used facilities, improve accessibility, enhance signage. All these are the little things that might make a big difference for communities and users. While the Greater Minnesota Regional Parks and Trails Commission has been successful in designating and developing parks, it could do even more. So in closing, I'd like to thank you for your support of legacy funding and ask that you provide the general dollar funds for the commission's operation so that more legacy funds can be put into our regional parks and trails. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kennedy. Um, any questions from members to Senator House Chow? or the testifiers. Okay. Mr. Chair, if nobody else is, I guess I don't want to talk to the mic. Sure. You, you go ahead. Uh, Thank Senator you, Mr. Green. Chair. Uh, on, the, on the million dollars, uh, Senator Hochschild, this looks to me like it's going just for the bureaucracy. It's just going to go for the commission to run the commission, or is this actually going to go for projects? Senator House Chair. Thank you, Chair Herr and Senator Green. Um, part of the reason that we're doing this is to open up more of the legacy dollars from the sort of management side of this uh, to make sure that more of those legacy dollars go directly towards trails and, and parks uh, in greater Minnesota. So the idea here is that we would use general fund dollars to help cover that and then get more of those legacy dollars where they're, where they're really needed. So yes. So thank you, Mr. Chair. So what we're doing is sh once again just shifting money around, and so we're actually funding the, the, like I said, the bureaucracy. But thank you. Well, uh, Chair, Senator, if I could, yeah, Chair Her and Senator Green. Um, to be clear, we're already funding the funding the bureaucracy. The issue uh, for me is that legacy dollars, which purpose are to to impact our environment and provide for those recreation opportunities, are being used in that bureaucracy. So what I'm doing is actually not shifting money around. I'm in fact adding money to regional parks and trails to help cover those costs, so that more money gets at the ground level for for these parks and trails. Thank you, Sir Hao Xiao. Um, any uh, for the discussion of the bill, and or any. Members in the audience want to uh, speak in support? Okay. Looks like we're on here now. Um, so, House Child, any closing uh, comments? Thank you, Chair Her. Uh, I have no further comments. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Senator House Child. We will lay uh, this bill, Senate File 527, for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. Okay. 
back to our very patient and dedicated center, Senator Morrison, uh, Senate file 553. It's a safety education requirement for watercraft. Yeah. And uh, we have two remote testifiers uh, under this bill, so when you're when we're calling you, make sure you turn on your camera. Uh, Senator Morrison, do you have an A1 amendment? Mr. Chair, I do have an A1 amendment. Okay. So, Senator Morrison, move that A1 amendment uh, to Senate File 553 five, be adopted. Um, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Aye. Okay. Motion prevail. Uh, Senator Morrison, the, the bill as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, members, thank you for the opportunity to present Senate File 553, a bill to expand Minnesota's existing voter education program. Minnesota is blessed with a wealth of lakes and rivers, and we have a large and growing boating community that loves to recreate on those bodies of water. Minnesota ranks second in the United States for registered watercraft and first per capita. One of the silver linings of the pandemic is that we saw many people reconnecting or connecting for the first time with the outdoors, and getting out on the lakes was part of that boom. In the last few years, 16,000 new motorized watercraft have been registered and added to our waters. This has inevitably led to increased boating traffic on our lakes and rivers. Many have observed unsafe operations, operating in shallow water, damaging aquatic plants, disturbing lake sediments, and shoreline erosion. And we've seen a rise in boater fatalities, most in situations where the operator had no safety instruction. Minnesota is one of just a few states that does not require all boaters to take an education course and test before launching on our lakes and rivers. Currently, a person with no boater training can buy a boat capable of going 70 miles an hour or putting up a five-foot wake and launch with no training or experience. Senate File 553 would create an online boater education course that includes best practices for boater safety, aquatic invasive species spread prevention, etiquette to reduce user conflicts, and an understanding of lake ecology so boaters know how poor boating operation can cause damage to the fishery shorelines and water quality. This bill has the support of a large coalition that includes boat dealers, lake associations, law enforcement, chambers of commerce, and resorts. So with that, Mr. Chair and members, I will turn it over to testifiers. Uh, let's, let's start with the one on, in remote first, just so that we have connection. Um, let's begin with um, Mr. Jab Jabor, um, Tonka Bay Ma Marina. Can you turn on your camera? I'm trying, Mr. Chair. It's not, I need to be given permission from you to do it from the host. There we go. We will need to turn on video from your side. I think. Mr. Chair, uh, I had with you, and all of a sudden I got There you go. So. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chair, member of the committee, um, thank you very much. It's a privilege for me to be in front of you. My name is Gabriel Jabour. I live in 985 Pankawa Road in the city of Ono, Minnesota. And I lived there for the last 51 years on Lake Minnetonka. I have a variety of business interests, and one of them is I own several marinas on Minnetonka and a small, a small boat manufacturer in Ohio that's been there since 1906, building wood boats by the Amish. I have a variety of hats, and one of them I participate in civil uh, responsibility by working with cities, agencies, etc. I've been in a volunteer position, an elected position, almost every single position available in local government, including the mayor of my city. And I do similar activities with regarding water with a variety of national agencies, etc. I'm not 
trying to brag about it. I'm just telling you my commitment to the resources are absolutely there. It's hard to follow Senator Morrison in, converse, in presentation because she really have her presentation covering any and all possibilities that I could say. The only thing I could tell you, I helped the last four elected uh, sheriffs of Hennepin County from Walmart to uh, Hutchinson. I'm hoping to, to help the present sheriff office in issues regarding the lead. I have seen enormous amount of abuse of uh, use of the leg and abuse of borders. At the same time, I've seen the results of it from boats burning down to people getting killed to et cetera. It is, in my estimation, this bill will go a long, long way to help remedy some of those issues. Furthermore, I work with, with the DNR on public access. As a matter of fact, I got an award from them for developing two accesses on Minnetonka. In my estimation, that public access is not being provided to the general public equally when a couple of people go out and dominate the leg, and there's very little you could do besides giving them a small ticket, which probably is half to a quarter what it takes in revenue to fill your gas tank. There's no way you could remove them off the water. Thus, the rest of the users who are abiding by the law are really doing a good job and not able to use the resource the way it should be. I'm a strong proponent for all, as the state constitution visioned, that to use the, the, the resource, but to use it responsibly. And this bill will go far, far further than any of our public accesses do give the use of it. Not to talk preserving our leg and for years and years to come. One more thing, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, I can't tell you how we are in a very unique position today because all entities who traditionally at odds from the boat manufacturer who wants to put any and every boat possible on the water to leg association who wants to restrict some of it are in favor of this bill. I'm fortunate to be part of the coalition of lots of people who never got along, that we're all getting along, and I really, really ask your committee and the state of Minnesota to take advantage of this opportunity and pass this bill. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Mr. Jabor. You may stay on in case uh, later members have questions. Uh, let's go to the next testifier, uh, Mr. Schneider, uh, President of the Minnesota Coalition of Lake Association. Uh, again, uh, please turn on your camera. Should be live. Mr. Chair and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to speak today on this important measure. My name is Joe Schneider, and I am here representing the Minnesota Coalition of Lake Associations. We are a volunteer nonprofit organization that works to protect our public waters. Our organization is made up of coalitions of lake and river associations across the state of Minnesota, as well as many individual lake and river associations. In my role as president of Minnesota COLA, I am here to encourage you to support Senate file uh, uh, 553, and I look forward to it getting enacted into law. Almost no one I speak with can comprehend why Minnesota would not have a requirement for all boat operators to have education and an operator's license. And especially so given the number of navigable waters in Minnesota, the number of registered watercraft, and the number of boaters who enjoy these waters. Making, ma making Minnesota's lakes and rivers safer for recreation and protecting these waters from negative ecological impacts are critical focus areas for the organization I have the privilege of leading, Mincola. So we are very excited that the proposed watercraft operator's license, coupled with mandatory education, will be a big step forward in addressing both those safety and ecological impacts. Last year, when an earlier version of this bill was being crafted, Minnesota, partner, Minnesota COLA partnered with a few other organizations who also believe a watercraft operator's license will make a big difference in boating safety and environmental protections. 
As, as Mr. DeBoer mentioned, we hadn't partnered before, but we all agreed on this important need and felt that being locked at the hip on this issue would help speed its passage. Today, you have heard from and will hear from more of these organizations, including law enforcement, on the importance of moving this legislation forward. The education component of this legislation will make boating safer for all users on the water, along with people of all ages who enjoy the water from a dock or a shore. By addressing AIS in the education, we can help boaters understand the impacts that AIS has done to our waters and the best practices should, and the best practices they as boaters should take to help stop the spread. We also look to the education to protect the shorelines and lake beds from powerful waves and downward thrusts of propellers. Minnesota Coal was actively involved to help fund two of the, of the uh, stages of phases of wake research done by the St. Anthony Falls Laboratory at the University of Minnesota. And we hope that this groundbreaking work will guide the best practice elements of the education. We believe that the education's best practices must consider the wide variety of users of our public waters, including motorized and non-motorized activities from swimming to fishing to paddling to sailing to skiing to surfing, et cetera, as well as newer types of education, uh, newer types of recreation activities as they gain acceptance. And let's not forget the impact, to, to consider the impact on loonness and the best practices. In conclusion, Minnesota COLA looks forward to having the opportunity to work with the DNR on this important education component. With that, I'd like to thank you for your time and attention today. Thank you, Mr. Schneider. Um, stay online in, in case we have a question for you. Uh, next testifier, um, either one, um, Officer Block. Go ahead. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Adam Block. I'm a conservation officer serving as the DNR State Boating Law Administrator for the past five years. I'm here today in support of Senate File 553 that will expand the requirements for boating safety education while on our waterways. In 2022, Minnesota had almost 620,000 motorized boats navigating our waterways. As more and more boaters visit their favorite waterway, we continue to see increased congestion, which requires a greater degree of skill and education to safely operate their motorboat. In the 1990s, Minnesota became a leader in the country regarding boating education requirements. When we established requirements for our youth to obtain boater safety education, if they chose to operate a motorboat. While that was a great first step, Minnesota has been passed by many states across this country who've expanded the requirements over the years. This first step proved that further education saves lives as we saw our boating fatality and injury numbers sharply decline after the youth requirements were signed into law. Minnesotans and many others that visit this state value the experiences and memories made while spending the day on the water. However, too often those experiences and memories end in tragedy. Our 2022 boating fatality report is awaiting final numbers, but currently we have 15 fatalities listed with the average age of just under 42 years old, operating on average a 19-foot motorboat. With the added boating pressure we are experiencing, coupled with the amount of tragedy occurring in our waterways, I am asking that you support Senate File 553 to protect our waterways and make them safe for all users. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Officer Block. Um, Mr. Forster. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Jeff Forster and I'm Executive Director of Minnesota Lakes and Rivers Advocates. Uh, we were formed in 1993 uh, and have lake home and cabin owners, uh, over 250 lake association members, um, resort owners, uh, anglers, marina owners, people engaged in water recreation. And it was about four or five years ago, we began to get emails um, on different issues with boating. Um, safety, um, ecological impacts from uh, different boating practices and different types of boats. Um, people, you know, incompatibility among users like paddleboarder trying to paddleboard on a lake that's got a lot of, um, you know, wake surfing watercraft. Um, and so we began to reach out to other organizations in the state and this bill is the product of that partnership that previous testifiers have talked about. Um, 
I guess I'll be brief. Uh, we urge your support of this bill. Um, I speak to people all across the state and have yet to find someone who's against it. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you much, very much, Mr. Forrester. Uh, next testifier, Mr. Strand now from Sierra Club. Please come forth and welcome. Yes. Once you're situated, um, please state your name for the record, Mr. Mr. Strand. Yes, hello. Um, <clears throat> good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chair and uh, fellow members here of the committee. Uh, my name is Mark Strand, and uh, I'm going to ask your patience here a little bit um, because this is my first time testifying in front of a committee. So I may not get the protocols quite right, but I hope you'll be patient with that, and I will try. Um, I'm a volunteer uh, representative of the uh, Waters and Wetlands Stewards Committee, which is part of the North Star chapter of the Sierra Club. And um, our committee uh, researches and develops policy uh, positions on various water-related issues uh, with the intent of advocating for the protection of the environment by educating the public and testifying at legislative hearings. Additionally, I uh, am also a uh, U.S. Merchant Marine Officer. Uh, I have a master's license uh, from the U.S. Uh, Coast Guard, and I have had, I've had that license for many years, and um, I've had many experiences sharing the waterways with others, uh, not only here in Minnesota, but uh, many other places around the U.S. and even internationally. Um, the one thing that I really have noticed is that the more training and the more experienced boaters have, the better they are at operating those vessels safely with respect to public safety and to the environment, uh, protecting the environment. I have done uh, a ver uh, occasional ed educating of boaters as well, professionally, and like uh, someone was saying earlier here, I think it was Senator Morrison, that uh, you can literally step onto a, buy a boat, 70 mile an hour boat, without any knowledge about how to manage that boat. And I have seen many, many times, uh, I could go on for, uh, <laughs> with lots of experiences here that I've, uh, I've had with this, and it's, it's not good. It's not safe out there. And we, we really do need to do a number of things. And one of those things is to uh, have a uh, training course and, and licensure of boat operators. Uh, I've often discussed this need with uh, fellow professional uh, uh, mariners. And they, all of them have agreed we need to do something. Uh, like it's been said, Minnesota is one of the few that doesn't have something for adults, any sort of training or licensure, and that really needs to change. Um, so on to the Sierra Club aspect of this. Uh, Sierra Club aims to help everyone enjoy the recreational benefits of our natural resources in a manner that protects the environment now and in the future. Uh, we wish to thank the bill's authors here for uh, bringing this uh, uh, bill forward again this year. Uh, and we think that Minnesota's, Minnesotans will benefit from, a bill, from this bill. Um, however, however, to ensure the support of voters, shoreline owners, environmentalists, and others, uh, we offer some amendments to the current language. Uh, we feel these men amendments will get more boaters trained sooner, and also uh, be more specific about uh, content, uh, course content, of what we're training the boaters uh, to make sure that it meets uh, the Minnesota, Minnesota's needs. So we, uh, you may have a, 
um, handout in front of you or uh, um, <clears throat> a written testimony. But there's basically two areas, and that's another. First one is the uh, definition of uh, adult operator. We're in essence saying we need to increase the number of adults that are getting trained. Uh, so uh, from essentially 40 years old and younger to 50 years old and younger, and still doing it within the five-year period. Uh, we feel that like, that will, uh, uh, what that will do, we feel is we'll, um, the sooner the boaters are trained, the sooner public safety and the environment will benefit. If you consider age-related attrition, it will take you know, roughly 30 years and so we're just trying to, to before all boaters will be uh, per, uh, trained and permitted. Uh, so we're trying to cut that number down a little bit here and try to uh, improve public safety and environment protection. Next is the watercraft safety program. Um, we're finding that uh, the uh, language that we're providing, uh, the amendment here, We'll give more authority and responsibility to our local stakeholders for de determining course content. And we believe that this uh, may strengthen voter support for this bill. And although I know it's been said that every, uh, most everyone, anyone talks to is in support of it, uh, I think uh, giving uh, voters and uh, more say on, on how how we deliver, what the content is going to be, will, will be beneficial in uh, uh, keeping the interest in this bill going forward and getting it passed. Um, we're seeing that, we're also saying that uh, the National Association of State Voting Law Administrators uh, take on a supportive and advisory role uh, and can continue with their expertise in the pursuit of our, our goals here. So, um, the actual language here uh, changes. I think you can see those if you have that uh, document there for the uh, increasing the number of voters being trained. We just change the yearly dates on that. And then as far as the water safe, watercraft safety program, uh, again, uh, there are some just important key points I'll make quickly here and then I'll be done. Uh, we're looking at uh, when the commissioner establishes a working group of uh, interested parties, that we've kind of phrased it slightly differently. We added the proviso there is Minnesota-based uh, interests. And uh, also that we see the, uh, the most benefit here for uh, our goals here, especially in the environmental side of things is to, uh, we still want the National Association of State Boarding Law Administrators to be involved. We think that's very important. Uh, but we want to maybe see uh, a change from the language right now says it has to be approved by them. We're suggesting that they are taking on a uh, supportive or advisory role and certainly very important to follow. But we want that approval to be at a different level here. Okay, and then um, also there is a state, current statement right now says uh, the course must include content on best management practices. Uh, it leaves us at the Sierra Club here wondering what that means exactly. And we want to make sure that uh, it includes uh, significant environmental protections. Uh, and so uh, we have rewritten the uh, um, language there uh, somewhat uh, that uh, to t help us and help hopefully the, the, this bill to be more specific about what that content is going to be. And as, I, as we have stated here, uh, it's, it's uh, providing content or including content on what boaters must do to prevent the spread of aquatic invasive species and protect all aspects of lake and river ecology based on sound peer-reviewed scientific studies. So those are the uh, amendments that we're proposing. 
And uh, in summary here, uh, as I say in my uh, document, our aim is to ensure that all Minnesotans are represented in the development of course content, the environment is protected for future generations and their recreational pursuits, public safety is at the highest level possible for everyone using our lakes and rivers, and all boaters will have access to areas where they can operate their boats knowing they will not infringe on others' enjoyment or damage the environment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Strand, and, and thank you for um, making um, some advisory proposal as well. So, um, members, any questions to the testifiers? Uh, Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Senator Morrison, for bringing this much-needed bill. I guess if um, Mr. Block, uh, I, I want to ask, a premise this, um, Senate District 34 follows this Mississippi River. Uh, there's a little pool that starts at the Champlain Anoka Bridge, actually a little bit farther west of that. And I say Champlain before Anoka because I'm from Champlain. But there's a problem between there and the wonderful, beautiful Coon Rapids Dam. Uh, one time we were there and this boat flies down um, this waterway and somebody had a GPS. I don't know how they were able to do it, but they tagged that boat going 100 miles an hour. And that's moving on water. And then there's a group of citizens throughout the years that have been talking about this introduction of these boats and, you know, the difference between the, the, the ledge of Anoka to Champlin or Coon Rapids and Champlin, Brooklyn Park and, and Coon Rapids, it's not that far, but it's a nice pool of water. These wake boats, and if you've ever seen the topography of, along that river, you know, riprap, you got everything that's trees that are sitting there. And these boats were throwing up these huge waves in that confined area. And much to the disturbance of the, of the sides of the hills. And so I guess the question to you um, is, does this bill, first of all, I said thank you for bringing this as much needed, but I, I didn't see the language of wake boards, boats in there. And, and there are lots of citizens. And, and if you look at that stretch, of that six mile stretch, there's more people and populated in there than along this whole stretch of, of the Mississippi River, just because these are houses that are there. Uh, but the concern has always been about safety and also the, the deterioration of the, of the sides of the pool. Does this education piece that, that is being presented in Senator Morrison's bill address that issue that, that I see um, that's been there in recent years? And it's kind of disturbing to see. So I don't know if that's a fair question to our wonderful DNR person who kind of oversees that. Because here's the other thing, too, with that, Senator Morrison, is the who controls what happens in that water because it's two different counties. You have, Car you have Carver County, you have Anoka County on one side and Hempen County on the other. But then because of that stretch, it's a national parkway for the federal government. So uh, there's always been this who controls what in that. And if that addresses some of that, then so be it. And if it doesn't, then maybe perhaps we should talk offline about how to get that included in there. So I don't know if that's a fair question for our expert here or is that one for you, Senator? Mr. Mr. Chair. Block or Senator Morrison. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I'll, and I'll defer to Officer Block, but I, I uh, Senator Hoffman, the intent and the reason that this coalition has come together is partly because of this new advent of wake boats on our, on our lakes. And the intent of the education um, that DNR is going to put together is to make sure that people are operating wake boats appropriately. Um, to see if we can get to where we don't have to have major restrictions when people are educated about the damage that they could do in the areas that they should and should not be using them. So, and with that, I'll, I'll defer to you, sir. Officer Block. Mr. Chair, Senator Hoffman, that is correct. Um, that stakeholder input would be valuable in our content creation as to what it is that we are going to include in that safety uh, education piece, but certainly wake boat operation has become an increased uh, activity that we're seeing all across the state on our waterways, and would be something that would be, would be needed in that information. So Mr. Chair, Hoffman? as a follow-up, the, the age range, I'm wondering, uh, 
most of the operators that we see on those big wake boats, and, and clearly this boat that was going, it was like a bullet. I mean, I was like blown away, and I don't know how somebody, somebody smarter than me was able to tag it going at 100 miles an hour was beyond. Um, most of the, it looks like the age range of that is not the 12 to 17 or 18, but there's that period between 18 and above that we're operating these massive wake boats that were throwing some pretty heavy waves uh, against the size of the pool. So um, it, was there any conversation in, in your committee or your group about uh, the reasons why that age range was there and, and, and how are the folks that, that are older than 18 going to get this education in place too? Sarah Morrison, I'm Office of Law. Uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Hoffman, I'm not sure I understand your question. The, the, the age, the require, according to the way the bill is written, um, you're exempted um, if you're born before 1987. Mr. Hoffman? Is Senator, uh, it looked like there was a, the key, let me pull this up, 12 to 17. Uh, and the exemption, 18, yeah, there was a, a message it, in your language, I highlighted it, 18 and older is actually exempt from, from that. And, and um, I don't know too many 17-year-olds that are, that are able to pay for a $350,000 wakeboard boat to, to do the damage that they're doing on the Mississippi River. So that's just more of a... Yeah, Mr. Chair, Senator Hoffman, so. that's, a, that's a fair point. I think that's in current law. The bill would would require them to un undergo the education and permitting. Yeah, Sarah Morrison and uh, Sarah Hoffman, uh, let uh, Council Ben Stanley clarify. Mr. Chair, Member Senator Hoffman, yes, the age uh, groups that are laid out in the bill are identical, almost identical to the age groups that exist in current statute. And so once you require a person who's 18 or older to receive this kind of training and get an operator's permit, they will be functionally very similar to what is required of 12 to 17 year olds right now. And so that's why the bill refers to those who are 12 and older as adult operators under this new bill language. But the distinction between those who are 12 to 17 on the one hand, 18 and older on the other hand, is something that exists in current statute. So, Mr. Chair, if I could Senator just ask, Hoffman. so I guess I'm not reading it well then. If you're currently 18 and older, you're not required to get a permit to operate a boat, correct? Yes. And, and that nothing would change in this, this bill, it's, you're still able to operate a boat without a permit, correct? Mr. Stanley. Mr. Chair, Senator Hoffman, no. Uh, if, this bill, if this bill was enacted, you, a person who is 18 or older, born after the dates on page one, lines 19 through 22, would be required to get a permit, and to get that permit, they would have to go through the training that the bill requires. Ultimately, as uh, Senator Morrison said, that would apply to anybody who wants to operate a motorboat who was born after July 1, 1987. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. I did. Thank you for that. I guess I should go back to math school. So, um, I love this bill. I. I I'd like to see stronger, but I, I really love this bill. It gets us to the education part of it. And so I appreciate you bringing this bill, Senator Morrison. Uh, Senator Lane. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator, actually, I think it's Mr. probably more of a question for Mr. Block. Um, I'm just curious about the amendment. This is something where uh, last year in committee we had a pretty robust discussion about uh, this topic, this bill is quite a bit different uh, from last year, but we had a very robust discussion about the 75 horsepower deal. So I'm curious maybe where the amendment came from. Um, I think we had a pretty good consensus in the committee when it came to the, this particular item um, on both sides of the aisle. Um, can you elaborate on the amendment? Senator Morrison. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, um, if Mr. Stanley would weigh in. Mr. Stanley. Mr. Chair, Member Senator Lang, uh, the amendment actually takes that portion of the bill and makes it what it was in last year's bill. Cor correct. <laughs> I agree totally. My question is, I, we, I think as a committee, we, 
kind of came to the conclusion that it's a little arbitrary and possibly not very helpful when it comes to the 75 horsepower rating. And that's why I was asking the DNR. I, th I think, uh, I don't know if you were here, Mr. Block, or if it was maybe Colonel Langer that was present at the time. Officer Block. Mr. Chair, Senator Lang. Um, I was here. I did testify. I don't recall that specific uh, portion of it. But uh, the way the amendment reads is that this would be folks that don't have the training. So if they have that person in the boat with them, it's still allowing them to operate up to 75. If you have somebody in a boat without any training and just having another person, another adult in there, I think there could be some issues with somebody operating at a much larger horsepower. I mean, these boats are getting bigger and bigger. The average uh, size of a craft involved in a fatality now is 19 feet. Um, you know, they're not getting smaller. And the horsepower is keeping right up with that. And as Senator Hoffman mentioned, boats are going 100 miles an hour, and we're potentially exposing more risk, I would say, with, with the greater horsepower. Senator Knight? My, my, my point, thank you, Mr. Chair, my point is that 75 horsepower on a 30-foot pontoon probably isn't a big issue. On a 16-foot on a boat, it sure probably is. My point, the 75 horsepower is kind of an arbitrary I'd much rather see 40 miles an hour, for example, or something of the sort that that made sense, not so much that 75 horsepower. Also, uh, on, a, on the paragraph B, it talks about, uh, oh, I'm sorry, it is paragraph A. Uh, I take that back. It is paragraph B. The personal watercraft portion of it. Now, can you explain why a personal watercraft is listed separately? Mr. Officer Black, or Mr. Stanley. Mr. Stanley. Chair, Member Senator Lang, this language on this amendment, both paragraphs, preserves the current statutory status quo, with one exception, and, I, and I'm wondering if this is what you might have been talking about. There is in current statute an exemption for young operators to operate a motorboat that is 25 horsepower. Or less and this bill as amended does get rid of that exemption so I'm not sure if that answers your question but I was getting there. <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you mr. chair yeah I, I was getting there because I was trying to defend that 25 horsepower and under because I have kids that uh, use that but uh, that isn't exactly where I was going and I, I the point I'm trying to make again now 75 horsepower on a personal watercraft is a that is a lot of power in a personal watercraft versus a 75 horsepower pontoon. Again, where this amendment kind of muddies the water in my viewpoint and says, we, we put a statutory, we're going to put a, a number on horsepower where I think it has a lot less to do with safety than, than what we may think, if that makes sense, uh, especially when it comes to personal watercraft. Now, it, for some reason, I guess the, the, really the question is, other than a personal watercraft, I mean, not a personal watercraft, yeah. So why, I guess, is the question more than anything. Is that, is that 75 horsepower? Is that just because it's been in statute for so long that we use it, more or less? Officer Block. Thank that was you. a long question. I'm sorry. Mr. Chair, <laughs> Senator Lang, my head doesn't make noise, my grandma always said. So yes, it's just been there for... Okay. For I, I, I guess I'm just wondering at the end of the day, Mr. Chair, if we, we do ourselves a little more justice by not having this amendment on the bill if that makes any sense, or amending the amendment to make it sound like. Now, the worst of it is, is that I don't know what that speed is, what that safety factor looks like. So I don't really have a good amendment to offer to make this better, if that makes sense. It's just, it's kind of arbitrary in my viewpoint. And, and um, you know, this is something we can talk about further either in this committee or um, as, it, as will be referred to the transportation, so <laughs> speed will be more relevant <laughs> there. Uh, well, to, to his point, Mr. Chair, right? I mean, what is it? Because those, those wake boats, they're massive. I mean, and they're pushing out. I don't know what's the horsepower that's, that these things are doing, right? I mean, it's like, I don't know if 75. I mean, that's actually a, a valid point. I don't think a 75 horsepower um, engine can get a boat going 100 miles an hour. Now, if you line five of them up in a row, I, I suppose you could get that. Or if you line, you know, underneath that, you're still doing that. But, um, yeah, because the real issue is, is there a way around that 75 that 
is an intended consequence versus mileage. What's the actual speed? And I don't know, the good senator from Western Minnesota is bringing up a pretty good point. I think lead you down that path, sorry. No, I'm glad you did. I mean, Mr. Well, Chair, because that really... Come and hang out with me in Champa. If you want to come to the finest Italian restaurant in the state of Minnesota, Buena Sera, no, there's no payola here. But the, the fact is you can go and, and see, especially when the, when the water's open, uh, firsthand experience of some of these boats that you know most of them are doing, to, the, to Senator uh, Lang's point, most of them are just your little, you know, um, Putt putt boats, you know the party yachts. People are just hanging out. They're doing what they're doing along. They're fishing in there, and and all of a sudden, whoosh, this thing comes flying by, and it's like seriously, um, you know, uh, I I have deep concerns about that, and and I just I'm glad he raised that point. So maybe to sure. your point, Senator Chair, uh, speed is a, an issue in transportation. I don't know. I mean, the experts sitting right there next to Dr. <clears throat> Morrison. So yeah. you know, I don't know. And I think some of us will have another crack at it at the transportation. So I'll, I'll leave it to, to um, Sam Morrison, to, or you know, if we're gonna make amendment or you know, we already voted for it already. But if we are we gonna make an amendment, uh, we have to plan a little early and have a little discussion beforehand. Uh, detract de de our amendment will defeat the purpose that we spend spent uh, quite a amount of time discussing it. So, Senator Morrison, I, unless anybody have any further uh, question discussion? No, I just I, think, Mr. Chair, I just, I don't really have a good amendment to offer to try to, right. to, to I was throwing a, a thought grenade out there and it kind of exploded on everybody, I'm sorry, but. Um, <laughs> okay. Well, let's go to Senator Eichhorn then. Thank you, Mr. Chair. On that note, um, just wanted to clarify, first of all, one thing that was said earlier, and maybe you misspoke when you were answering Senator Hoffman's question. You'd said this is about wake boats. Is this about wake boats, or is this about safety, or is it about both? Senator Morrison. Uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Eichhorn, I did not say it was just about wake boats, but wake boats are on our lakes and rivers, and they are part of the safety and education conversation. It's about motorized watercraft. Mr. Chair. Senator Eichhorn. Well, we already have lots of laws about wake, so I'll move on from that. Um, the, next, the next piece I wanted to ask about is probably for Mr. Block. I know you'd mentioned there was 15 or 18 deaths, and that's part of the reason we need some additional training. Can you speak to how many of those uh, alcohol was involved in the accident? Officer Block. Mr. Chair, Senator Eichhorn, I don't have that in front of me. It generally runs in that 50 to 60 percent year over year alcohols involved okay Sorry. that's helpful to know so we we know that obviously alcohol is part of the problem and I assume if we legalize marijuana that's going to be part of the problem too as we're looking at boating or any other driving or recreation so certainly is that there's a concern there and I hope that as the DNR looks at that they have a you know driving under the influence piece of the training I think that would obviously be very important because sometimes I think folks forget about that Another comment that was made several times today is that nobody's opposed to this. I've heard from nine, ten resorts in my district that are very concerned about this, especially the, the rental business piece of it. Many of them saying, forget it, I may just get out of the boat rental business. Um, this is a little bit onerous for them, in their opinion. Um, and on that realm, I'm just wondering a couple things about it. First one is... The person renting the boat, this was on page four, subdivision two, uh, says that they must ensure that only the listed authorized operators uh, operate the motorboat or personal watercraft. How are we going to police that, so to speak? Is the, is the resort owner now going to hire a kid to go sit on the boat to make sure only the two people listed run the boat? or uh, What's going to be expected of them? Senator Morrison. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Eichhorn. You know, I, I think that most resort owners are going to want their boats to remain intact, um, and a lot of them have gotten on board. I can't speak to 100% of them, but a lot of them um, are for it, and I, I think uh, Mr. Carlson would have something to add to this conversation, too. Mr. Carlson. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. Joel Carlson here on behalf of the community of Minnesota Resorts, and we've been very active in the development of this bill. And, uh, um, and Senator Eichhorn, we appreciate your concern. In fact, we have been working on an amendment with the proponents that would take the resort owners off of the enforcement part of this on page four. They would not be defined as a motorboat rental business. We're in the lodging business. We provide information to our guests, but the kinds of complaints you're hearing about and the wakeboard issues, that's not what we're in the rental business for. You're not hearing very many complaints about a 14-foot Lund with a 15-horsepower motor. And so the concept that uh, we hope will be coming in, a, in an amendment, I know uh, Mr. Stanley has um, received it, that has been posted in the House, um, will just exempt resort operators from that enforcement part of that. We want to be involved in the training. We want to be involved in developing the program. Um, but trying to do that enforcement at a resort with... 40 guests on check-in day is just we've we've struggled with it and we just came to a conclusion um, in um, in early January with the proponents that we'll just write resorters out of that part of it and I, I hesitate to comment on it because Senator Morrison and I haven't uh, fully um, engaged on that issue we've emailed but we haven't I, I, I've learned very early in my career never try an amendment on the author's bill when they haven't said yes. So uh, I didn't want to have it offered without making sure that she was comfortable with it. But I think that's the route we're headed. And that takes care of the concerns of the resorts that have contacted you and that I represent. Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Icorn. Mr. Chair, Senator Morrison, be helpful to know, based on uh, what Mr. Carlson kind of talked about, is that something you're open to entertaining? I realize we don't have the language in front of us and you'd have to see the language first. but. If that amendment is ready for, say, transportation, is that something you'd be willing to entertain? I mean, I, what I'm looking for is to protect our resort folks because they're already in a tough spot. Senator Morrison. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Eichhorn. I'm certainly open to it. Um, I do want to talk to all the coalition members, but I'm, I'm certainly open to it, yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Thank you. Any uh, further discussion from members? Mr. Chair. Senator Green. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. First of all, for Mr. Block, is there any estimate uh, or estimation on what this is going to cost for the licensing, for the training? Uh, who's going to pay for it? Mr. Block, or Officer Block. Mr. Chair, Senator Green, currently uh, the state of Minnesota uses a third-party vendor for the online portion if people choose to do that, and it's $24.95, so it's passed on to the individual looking for the training. We also offer a free paper copy upon request. Senator Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Does that include the license? Because the license is going to have to be redone. You're going to have to get a permit, which I assume is going to cost you some money besides the training, and then eventually you're going to have to go get your license redone with the, uh, I think there's going to be an endorsement on it. Is that correct? Officer uh, Blanc. Mr. Chair, Senator Green, the implementation of the issuance of the license, if they take the paper copy or something, those Fees, um, we have Coast Guard grant funding from the Recreational Boating Safety Grant that can uh, pay for those funds, or for those costs. Okay. Thank and you. And then, for, thank Senator you, Mr. Chair, and for the author. Um, I didn't have time to really dig too deep because I was in other bills, but on page four, uh, starting in line two, in that paragraph, it references the National Association of State Boating Law Administrators, and they're going to have to approve anything that we do who are they or what are they? Senator Morrison. Th thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Green, and I will defer to Officer Block to answer that question. Officer Block. Mr. Chair, Senator Green, I am one of those. Uh, that is the state boating law administrator for every state, so every state and territory has one of those. It is a required function to receive funding from the U.S. Coast Guard from the Recreational Boating Safety Grant. So what that national vetting does is um, it allows our program, amongst other states' programs, to be reciprocal upon each other. So if it's set to a national standard, it's going to be recognized in other states as well. Does that okay. answer your question? Kind of, yeah. Mr. Chair, one more question, and then I'll be done. Yes, Senator uh, Green. I've seen this language for the last few years, and one thing that I've never gotten an answer on, and maybe the author can help me out here, on page one, how did you come up with this formula for having to have uh, licenses and trainings for people that are, at, at this point, up to 41 years old, who probably have been running boats since they were 15, and now they're going to have to go get a license? But this formula looks kind of convoluted. How did you come up with that, or who came up with it? Senator Morrison. 
Uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Green, uh, I believe that's the standard um, in statute, but I'll defer to Mr. Stanley. Mr. Stanley. Mr. Chair, members, the final date that you'll see on line 22, uh, July 1, 1987, is the same date past which, if you were born, you have to get ATV training. And so the idea, I think, is that you have identical dates so that if you're required to get one, you're required to get the other if you were born after that date. And then, you know, early on in the bill drafting process, there, was, there were discussions about phasing that in. And so if you have that date and you sort of back out of it through a phased in process, this is one way you could do that. Okay. Thank you. All right. So thank you for a very thorough um, discussion on this bill, Senate file. Five five three. Um, I assume there's no te test fire from the audience. Okay, so we're good. Um, Senator Morrison, would you like to move Senate File 533 recommend to be re referred to the Transportation Committee as, as amended. amended? Yes, yes, sir, Mr. Chair. Thank you. So okay. moved. All right. All in favor of Senate File 533 as amended, be recommend to be referred to the transportation committee, say aye. 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 Opposed, nay? No. Okay, motion prevail. Um, motion prevail. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. C congratulations. Okay, all right, any other issue? Uh, Cara, um, community administrator, can you give us an update for next? Next, sure, uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. We will be hearing several PFAS related bills on Thursday as well as a bill requiring a report of fish kills. So um, we will see you then. Thank you. Okay, thank you, everyone. Uh, the committee is now adjourned.